From the Diary of Sherlock Holmes by Morris Baring Baker Street, January the 1st Starting a diary in order to jot down a few useful incidents, which of course will be no use to Watson. Watson very often fails to see that an unsuccessful case is more interesting from a professional point of view than a successful case. He means well. January the 6th Watson has gone to Brighton for a few days, for a change of air. This morning, quite an interesting little incident happened, which I know as a useful example on how people who have no powers of deduction nevertheless stumble on the truth for the wrong reason. This never happens to Watson, fortunately. Lestrade called from Scotland Yard with reference to a theft of a diamond and a ruby ring from Lady Dorothy Smith's wedding presents. The facts of the case were briefly these. On Thursday evening, such of the presents as were jewels had been brought down from Lady Dorothy's bedroom to the drawing room to be showing to an admiring group of friends. The ring was amongst these. After they had been shown, the jewels were taken upstairs once more and locked in the safe. The next morning, the ring was missing. Lestrade, after investigating the matter, came to the conclusion that the ring had not been stolen, but had either been dropped in the drawing room or replaced in one of the other cases. But since he'd searched the room and the remaining cases, his theory so far received no support. I accompanied him to Eaton Square to the residences of Lady Middlesex, Lady Dorothy's mother. While we were engaged in searching the drawing room, the Strad uttered a cry of triumph and produced a ring from the lining of the armchair. I told him he might enjoy the triumph, but that the matter was not quite as simple as he seemed to think. A glance at the ring showed to me that it was not only that the stones were false, but that the false ring had been made in a hurry. To deduce the name of the maker was, of course, child's play. Lestrade, or any pupil of Scotland Yard, would have taken it for granted that it was the same jeweller had made the real ring. I asked for the bridegroom's present, and in a short time I was interviewing the jeweller who had provided it. As I thought, he made a ring with imitation stones, made of dust of real stones, a week ago for a young lady. She had given no name and had fetched and paid for it herself. I deduced the obvious fact that Lady Dorothy had lost the real ring, her uncle's gift, and not daring to say so, had an imitation ring made. I returned to the house where I found Lestrade, who had called to make arrangements for watching the presents during their exhibition. I asked for Lady Dorothy, who at once said to me, The ring was found yesterday by Mr Lestrade. I know, I answered, but which ring? She could not repress a slight twitch of the eyelids as she said, There was only one ring. I told her of my discovery and of the investigations. This is a very odd coincidence, Mr Holmes, she said. Someone else must have ordered an imitation but you should examine my ring for yourself. Whereupon, she fetched the ring, and I saw it was no imitation. She had, of course, in the meantime, found the real ring. But to my intense annoyance, she took it to Lestrade and said to him, Isn't this the ring you found yesterday, Mr Lestrade? Lestrade examined it and said, Of course, it's exactly identical in every respect. And do you think it's an imitation? asked this most provoking young lady. Certainly not, said Lestrade. And turning to me, he added, Ah, Holmes, that is where theory leads one. At the yard, we go for facts. I could say nothing, but as I said goodbye to Lady Dorothy, I congratulated her on founding the real ring. The incident, although it proved the correctness of my reasoning, was vexing as it gave that ignorant blunderer an opportunity of crowing over me. 
January the 10th, a man called just as Watson and I were having breakfast. He didn't give his name. I asked if I knew who he was. I said, beyond seeing that you're unmarried, that you've travelled up this morning from Sussex, that you've served in the French army, that you write for reviews, and are interested in the battles of the Middle Ages, that you give lectures, and that you're a Roman Catholic, and you've once been to Japan. I don't know who you are. The man replied he was unmarried, but that he lived in Manchester, he'd never been to Sussex or Japan, that he'd never written a line in his life, he'd never served in any army, save the English Territorial Force, and so far from being a Roman Catholic, he was a Freemason, and he was by trade an electrical engineer. I suspected him of lying, and I asked him why his boots were covered in clay and chalk mixture peculiar to Horsham, why his boots were French Army service boots, elastic-sided, and probably bought at Valmy, why the second half of a return ticket from Southwater was emerging from his ticket pocket, why he wore the Medal of St Anthony on his watch chain, why he smokes cockerel cigarettes, why the proofs of an article in the Battle of Ailea were protruding from his breast pocket, together with a copy of the tablet, why he carried in his hand a parcel which, owing to the t untidy way in which he had been made, an untidiness which, in harmony with the rest of his clothes, showed that he could not be married, revealed the fact that it contained photographic magic lantern slides, and why he was tattooed on the left wrist with a Japanese fish. The reason I've come to consult you will explain some of these things, he answered. I was staying last night at the Windsor Hotel, and this morning I woke up. I found an entirely different set of clothes from my own. I called the waiter and pointed this out, but neither the waiter nor any of the other servants, after making full inquiries, were able to account for the change. None of the other occupants of the hotel had complained of anything being wrong with their own clothes. Two gentlemen had gone out early from the hotel at 7.30. One of them had left for good, the other was expected to return. All the belongings I'm wearing, including this parcel, which to contain slides, belongs to someone else. My own things contain nothing valuable, it consists of clothes, boots, very similar to these. My coat was also stuffed with papers. As to the tattoo, it was done at a Turkish bath by a shampooer who learned the trick in the Navy. The case did not present any features of the slightest interest. I merely advised a man to return to the hotel and await the real owner of the clothes, who was evidently the man that had gone out at 7.30. This is a case of my reasoning being with one partial exception, perfectly correct. Everything I had deduced would no doubt have fitted the real owner of the clothes. Watson asked rather irrelevantly why I had not noticed that the clothes were not the man's own clothes. A stupid question, as the clothes were reached down me, which fitted him as well as such clothes would ever fit, and he was probably of the same build as a rightful owner. January 12th, found a carbuncle of unusual size and a plum pudding, suspected the makings of an interesting case, but luckily, before I stated any hypothesis to Watson, who was greatly excited, Mrs Turner came in, noticed it, and said her naughty nephew Bill had been up to his tricks again, and that the red stone had come from a Christmas tree. Of course, I had not examined the stone with my lens. The end. I hope you enjoyed that one. If you did, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode. I've been Steve. Bye-bye.